down in 30 seconds. So. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Hello, Frank. Hi, how are you? So far, so good. I truly love this countdown uh, intro. The music yep. wakes me up if I feel sleepy. I did not feel sleepy <laughs> today, but nevertheless. <laughs> yeah, how was you actually? Uh, we discussed the last time, or we discussed uh, your upcoming conferences, and you traveled to several conferences. Yeah, many conferences in, in Germany, and I'm just back uh, the, this afternoon. I, I just came from the airport from, from the, um, the Postgres conference in uh, Germany. Yeah, it was really nice. And the Postgres conferences have more and more people. How many people were actually, and it, it was in Germany, right? And uh, how many Postgres? It was community? in, in Germany, and here it, I think it was 200, 250 uh, for the conference, where last year it was less than that. And they, they were surprised. They had the peak of registration just 10 days before, without really knowing why. I like this trend. And this trend uh, aligns with the growth trend of Postgres as a database. If you go yeah. to the DB engine, we have more users who use Postgres. We have more vendors who start creating Postgres compliance solutions. And you have more people joining Postgres SQL conferences. How did the community meet you? Like, uh, was that a warm? Did you have warm conversations with the community? Yeah, sure. It's it's also the occasion to, to meet the users, but also to meet the the. the the core uh, committers or, or on Postgres, you, yeah, that's always interesting. I've also mm -hmm. seen very interesting session about the, the user experience, like the, 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 the wow story from people who had problem in production. All right, I saw you posting uh, something about high, uh, some true, true high availability story with Postgres. You probably yeah. can discuss it a little bit uh, later when we will be covering something that happened on Hacker News last week, right, two weeks ago. Uh, nevertheless, everyone, uh, welcome again. That's our next uh, uh, episode of the Community Open Hours. That's the place, the platform for us, Yuga by DB community members to meet, to answer your questions, to discuss Yuga by DB architecture internals, and to show you something cool and something nice that is available in the uh, database and the ecosystem of solutions that are created for Yuga by DB or Postgres. So uh, 
let us know. Just feel free. This you can just watch us because we, we are going to show you some uh, cool new demos today. We have a new management and monitoring UI uh, that is now being released uh, and added into the Yuga by DB open source version. But nevertheless, you can always you know interrupt us whenever you like and ask your questions. And the questions can be related to your use case, something that is not clear to you, because that's also the platform for you just to get us. Uh, to bother us, right? Those who work with Yuga by DB on a daily basis. Yeah, right? that's we we are streaming on Twitch, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on uh, uh, Twitter. I think at the same time, and except for Twitter, uh, the others have a chat, and the goal is from saying hello to having uh, uh, technical questions. That's the goal of the of this hour. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, let's let's move forward to one of our highlights. What happened uh, since the last live stream we had? Uh, we had a very good and interesting discussion on PostgreSQL high availability options on Hacker News. So let me share the screen with you. I'll show you there uh, that discussion, and then uh, Frank and I we just want to share our thoughts on uh yep uh, this one i think i need to share this screen yeah so the discussion was the third the third most active discussion on hacker news for the several hours so like people truly loved it we've got 150 points we've got uh, 80 comments and the discussion was around this article and this article basically summarizes it's a good guidance. It's a good list uh, for various high availability options that you can have in PostgreSQL. The article reviewed uh, several deployment options because many of us, we just start with Postgres with a single instance, right? But we want to have that instance up and running even during different outages. And we discussed what are the potential high availability options. How can you improve high availability? Then we discussed deployments when you had a primary instance with read replicas, when you have a multi-master solution, such as uh, Citus data that can shard your uh, Postgres database. And also we discussed the multi-master solution without the coordinator. This was, was actually about Yuga by DB. So that was an interesting conversation on uh, Hacker News. You will find the links in the description of this video, and I will post the links uh, to the uh, comments section shortly. But while I'm doing that, Frank, what's because uh, you also I see that you in, you was involved in the conversation. What are the main observations? What are the main uh, uh, in, interest, any interesting insights that you learned from uh, that discussion? For me, the, the most interesting was that people are really discussing about technologies. It's easy to say I have ability, but then there are different levels. And uh, sometimes people talk about either their, produ their product or the product they know the best. And that, that, that's also a very good thing. You have I have ability only if you, if, if you can manage it. Uh, if you take a product that, is, that can bring a very high availability, but you don't know it, you do not configure it correctly, then you have problems. So the first thing is quite good that people use what they know. Uh, but was also interesting, sometimes people think uh, they know the product without really knowing it. For example, Citus was mentioned by some people thinking that it was fully ACID uh, globally which is not the case, uh, or, or also just thinking that it solves the high availability, but actually Citus just shards data, and then each shard is a Postgres database where you can have a standby. Um, so it's always good to, to have a picture in mind of how it works to, to really see how it solves high availability. Yeah, also, man, many people mention uh, Spanner. Yeah, actually, Spanner. I, I was I was trying I was trying to count how many times let's say Spanner was mentioned. Spanner was mentioned thirty eight times in this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, if to compare to Amazon Aurora, only five times. Citus data. Citus Citus. Let's do just Citus twelve times, which means that I mean I was really surprised. Which means that there, folks 
uh, truly aware of the benefits of Spanner. One of the disadvantages that I saw is that the cost of Spanner can be a little bit high. And uh, yeah. but for me, I mean, like if you if you need Spanner, it means that you truly have a distributed use case when you need to have high availability, low latency, and you're ready to pay. There are different options, but that also is uh, was a hint to us to those who work with other distributed SQL databases such as Yugabyte DB or Cockroach DB is that there is a big demand for these use cases. It's yeah, like this, this is this is really a validation of of the distributed SQL architecture to go beyond the standby primaries and, and really have something distributed and replicated. Yeah. Yep, excellent. And that was a very healthy conversation because it was not like a conversation what, what's better and what's worth. Folks came and they shared their experiences because you see that some of the folks use Aurora, some of the folks use Cytos, some of the use Spanner, etc. And that was a very insightful conversation where people, you know, just came and they are uh, share their opinion. So you will find you will find a link to this discussion in uh, uh, the description to the to this video on YouTube, etc. And also, if you're watching us right now, you will find it in their comments on your favorite platform. So if you have any other questions, feel free to ask. In the meantime, in the meantime, Frank, how about us uh, switching to the next topic, uh, to the new management and monitoring UI? Yeah. And and if people have questions about the, the previous topic, do not hesitate to, to interrupt also because maybe you have to think about it. Yeah, uh, we had the idea to show the the the, the new UI that comes with uh, with uh, Yugabyte DB. And first, I will share my screen and show what we had before. So. Before this new UI, when you start a Yugabyte DB cluster, you have a web console exposed by the, the master um, uh, because the master knows all other nodes of the cluster and exposed on port 7000. Uh, and basically, so this web console was really to see the minimal things, how things are, are working and uh, some statistics also about what is running. Basically, information about the cluster, replication factor three uh, to, to, uh, to be resilient, the number of nodes, I have only three there, I have only one user table, so many things very basic. Also the little things that are monitored like uh, all tablets are well balanced or not, uh, which version, etc. Uh, and we had also information about the tables there. N namespaces are basically the, the, the Postgres databases or the Cassandra namespaces. The tables, I, I still use this console when I want to see more information about a specific table. Where are the tablets, for example, where are the leaders? But for example, on performance, there is not a lot there. We can see the tablet servers, if they're up or not, and the basic statistics, the, the read-write operations per, per second. Question for you, Frank. What was the most frequently used dashboard on this UI for you? Which one for, did you... For me, this one, seeing the, the read-write operations to see if everything is balanced. Or I also often go to the, what we call uh, utilities, where we expose things that may not be easy to interpret when you don't know. But for example, the memory usage, uh, you can drill down to the memory usage, see which tablet takes too much memory, just the flags uh, uh, to know a specific value, if it's the default or not. So things that are very basic, but it was not so user-friendly because just for example, if you don't know what is a G flag, this will not help you a lot. And that's the way we internally call the uh, the, the configuration parameters for the cluster. Mm -hmm. um, users prefer configuration parameter rather than G flag. I don't even know what means the G, maybe a global flags, I don't know. 
So for me, for me, it sounded like when I joined the company, I thought like, what kind of Google flags do we have? Because yeah, for exactly. Me, G, 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 <laughs> I was thinking. Yeah, because Google. we also use some some Google libraries. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but nevertheless, I mean, it's like uh, what I would, what I, what I, what for me, this existing and for still, this is uh, the primary management and monitoring UI still because it's production ready. Uh, the new one that we will show you, it's available in a beta mode, but this one is. Uh, the current one is very comprehensive. It comes with a lot of capabilities. You can really drill down into different aspects, such as those flags or the partitioning or the leaders, a lot of the stuff. But like the reason why I ask you what was your most favorite or frequently used dashboard is most of the time you would go and see the performance metrics, right? We would see like the state of your cluster nodes. You would see the read and, uh, read and write workload. This is what we usually can look at all the times, whether our cluster is healthy or whether our cluster is experiencing any issues. So yep. that actually was also like this one, the one you show right now. This is usually what I show all the time. Sometimes I go like, when I when I when I want to show capabilities like uh, related to sharding and tablets, I go to the tablet tab. But this was my number one dashboard. And yep. probably that's why the, what's that's the reason why we started working on the, incorporating the new management and monitoring UI that has a a more contemporary version of this dashboard. Yeah, and, and, and this one was not so user friendly. For example, here I see the UID of of my servers can be interesting internally if I want to match something with something that I see in the log file. But for the user, no meaning. The IP address is not really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the cloud region zone are interesting, the number of tablets, but then I have to scroll. So the, th this view was more a support uh, view uh, or, or advanced user view. And then the new, the new one, let me just go to the port where it is exposed, 15433. Mm -hmm. And that's the new, new the new one so so much nicer of course and more user friendly first the overview of the cluster i have the same information but uh, meaningful the replication factor uh fault tolerance also something that we didn't have we had to look uh, for example let me just go if i wanted to see the level of fault tolerance if i'm tolerant to zone or region Mm -hmm. I think the way to do it on the other one was to go to cluster config. And I don't even know if we have a link on it in our, in our menu. And seeing the placement info, and that's for an advanced user may be useful, but for a normal user, uh, you just want to know that you uh, uh, have a fault tolerance at, at region level. Because yeah, basically, exactly. this is a cluster deployed on three uh, regions. And show show the regions like it means that you uh, each you have three nodes in total, and uh, it means that every node is located in a different cloud region. Yeah. Correct? If I okay. look at the list of nodes, this is where I will see them with their region, and also the read write operation. The same statistics, but only what is interesting that fits in the screen you can see per zone, region, or server, uh, the basic performance statistics and the number of tablets also that are uh, useful to, to see if everything is uh, well balanced. Uh, if it's well balanced, it's just green in the in the node elf. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's enough. And we can refresh. And also something, we show the most important uh, that is useful and that fits in the screen but you can uh, have a lot more information if you want the memory used and provisioned, for example, for each server. Uh, I don't even know what we expose, of course, yeah, the disk uh, storage, the processes, etc. So we can also add more interesting columns uh, showing the basic and, and more information there. Yeah, it looks, it looks, uh, it looks uh, much, much nicer. At least it looks like a fresh air this, like this yeah. is how I would say the UI looks like these days it's... uh and it's it's uh, we will show you sh soon uh, some of the workloads so that how you can use this UI to monitor to detect slow queries and then you can use 
standard approaches to optimize your queries. But in the meantime, you know what this UI reminds me of? It reminds me a lot of the Yuga by DB managed. Exactly. Uh, I think I have one there. Um, this is, let me check. If you want, I can sh share the screen and let's. I, I show it quickly there. So this is Yugabyte uh, managed where, where uh, I have a cluster deployed uh, here on AWS. And, and yeah, it looks the same just because we reuse the same technology. You can see the list of nodes, not even the list of, uh, here we cannot choose the more, um, it's not exactly the same the same version, but basically it's the same technology. If I come back to this one, and we have also the alerts, uh, wh wh what we did. So, so the big difference: Yugabyte managed the database is managed by by uh, Yugabyte, managed uh, supported by Yugabyte, and we started to do that. So basically, we started to put this old web console uh, on uh, with the database. So Mm -hmm. available open source and then for the users who have support and for the managed then we needed a, a, a new ui and we started to do that with the uh, the, the customers using managed and to improve it and then when it was okay we have moved the same to open source so that that's the idea it's part of the database having having a ui is part of the database so this is fully open source, uh, yep, and that, uh, require, uh, but th there are a few features that we put first on Manage just because it's easier also to get uh, the feedback. Uh, we have very big customers and, and getting their feedback is quite uh, interesting also uh, before putting that in general availability on, on, uh, on the open source. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting trend uh, and that's very that's a unique trend because many vendors when i was what 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 i what really what i was surprised of when i heard of yoga by db for the first time there is a claim that yoga by db is 100% open and this sounds like cliche because it's like okay you are open but in fact it means that all the enterprise features such as related to security or multi data center replication we call, we call it cluster uh, x replication right uh, etc everything is free because what happens with other vendors with other database technologies for instance you can have cassandra and we know that that's an open source database that belongs to apache software foundation but there are many enterprise features that are available by data stacks and data stacks is one of the major contributors to cassandra but they sell some enterprise features also related to security availability and my question was to the yuga by db team is like what do you sell then like if everything is in the enterprise and they say like we want everything to be available as open source but then we have yuga by db anywhere that allows you to simplify the deployment and operations of yuga by db in your private cloud or public cloud deployment so we have yuga by db managed that's it the rest is open source and we have this trend right now even with the ui and management and monitoring capabilities that ui was already battle tested and improved uh, for the Yuga by DB managed use cases. And right now we are gradually making it available in the Yuga by DB open source. It's all, you can download and install it right now. What's your version, Frank? I think you can jump back to the, uh, what's the version of the cluster? You can folks experiment with it today and uh, provide uh, Yeah, feedback. this is, uh, this is 2.19, yeah. Yeah, and I and, think it, and I was it's, running it's just start by, by default. If you start the database with Yuga by D, it starts by default the, the uh, the, the UI and it's uh, Java and uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 this open source model is quite interesting because some people think that open source is there to put features in beta uh, to, to get them to to a commercial edition of it later, and that's exactly the opposite. We if we have beta feature, it's easier to put them in a managed environment where we discuss with the customer to know exactly how it can be used or not. Uh, when we put it in open source, that means that a lot of users will use it and maybe without support. So the features must be stable there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you will have many more users, many more folks yeah. who are interested in your 
feature even if that feature is in beta mode so that's that means that like folks you've got a new feature this ui management and monitoring tool available for you it's not fully migrated yet you will probably find some let's say uh minor issues but uh, whatever you come across feel free to report and feel free to influence the improvements of this uh, new management and monitoring ui frank what else do we have let's let's go through the tabs and show like what's what's available yeah of course about for, for example for for me an improvement could be adding some text and not only icons uh, uh -huh. I will check if we have that in the roadmap or not, or maybe I will uh, open a Git issue. Always good to have text also uh, for, for to understand yeah, better what it uh -huh. is. Um, yeah, those are the list of tables. So we have two APIs. We can create uh, SQL tables, or we can create uh, uh, Cassandra-like uh, uh, tables. So we can see them. Yeah, I have only one table uh, on there. Most important is thing that so that we can see the large tables. So, so the size is, uh, is quite uh, important there. Uh, performance, I think you will see, you will show that more, but we have also nice visualization of the main, uh, the main uh, statistics, mm -hmm. which is quite uh, useful. Uh, the alerts, I think we don't have that yet on uh, open source. Um, yeah, that will take time. There are and, and setting also, uh, we don't have uh, that uh, yet. For the managed, uh, for for managed, this console is the only one. Uh, either you can do it with the console with the managed service, or you uh, ask to the support to do it. For open source, uh, you start it yourself. You can configure the the flags yourself. So so the most important is visualizing the uh the, the 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 setup the configuration and the performance and at the size looking at the size of the of everything yeah so that's right. basically what we what we can see there and yeah if people have questions or if they have remarks about it uh do not hesitate to open contact us on uh, in, in many way but but open uh, git issues uh, that's also the, the, the goal of putting that open source is also to have more users, more feedback uh, to get a, a better database. That's right. That's that's absolutely right. Because we are doing this for a reason. Okay, so we've got a question uh, from uh, Ashwar. So let me show this question. Uh, it's looking so nice and there are have it any option to import the data file directly to expand okay looks like yeah it looks like uh, Ashwar is talking about an ability to take a file with ddl and probably dml and to get it executed that would I be have... nice for the moment we don't have um like a sql pad uh for that but probably we will have at that one day or maybe the question, I don't know if it's importing a file. I, I think two things can be interesting, importing a SQL file, a file and executing, but also maybe importing a big CSV file ju just for the interface. That can be useful also. And I would say that this needs to be a natural trend for all of those you management and monitoring UIs, because when I used... Uh, to work at a different database company in the past, uh, that database also had a very wonderful UI for the management and monitoring. And the users kept asking for that ability to add the import data or import schema button. I just have this file, please just add it. And uh, I think that we also need to have it for, for Yuga by DB, why not? Because right now, let's say I'm studying my cluster and probably I already have some sample data set for experiments. I already, or oh, I have something that was uh, created uh, for Postgres and I want to load this. But also Ashward, uh, if that's you know just sample data set that you want to experiment with, so you have a dump of the data set, that's okay. But keep in mind that uh, we also have YugaBiteDB Voyager. Uh, this is a migration tool that was created for the purposes when you have, let's say PostgreSQL, MySQL, Oracle, and the tool can export your export your schema in data 
right into the Yuga by DB. So let's say if you already have, if your use case is you have a PostgreSQL instance running or you have Oracle or MySQL instance running, Voyager, Yuga by DB Voyager can connect to those databases and uh, export everything. Or, or yeah. simply CSV file. We can use Voyager just to import CSV file. The big advantage is that Voyager will look at the configuration to find the right uh, parallelism uh, to, to, to get uh, the, the, bet, the best throughput. Yeah, let me actually do this. I will share. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So yeah, Ashwar, thanks for your feedback and question because I think that that needs to be added as an improvement and we can check with uh, our product management team whether we have anything on the in the backlog. But also, if you have not done this yet, let me share with you. I will show you a link. Let me share the screen. And while you are sharing, maybe I, I can mention also, because we are Postgres compatible, there are many tools. For example, you can use DB either uh, that has also a lot of features. So yeah, we, 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 we also take care to be Postgres compatible and, and to integrate with existing tool uh, rather than reinventing something else. Exactly, exactly. And here is, we have a playlist on YouTube and that playlist uh, comes with several demos uh, that show, for instance, how to migrate your schema and data from Postgres, Oracle or MySQL using Yuga by DB Voyager. So let me, I will share a link to this one into the chat and then we will get to the Voyager, let me type in Voyager demo and then we will get to the workload demo for the new management and monitoring UI. All right, done. So yeah, I need to switch my screen back. Yeah, I want to share the entire screen and that's gonna be this screen. All right, folks, uh, so now Frank uh, did a tour through the new management and monitoring UI. Right now, let me show you how to use this uh, performance dashboard if you want to detect and take a look at live queries or slow queries. So my use case would be I want to find queries that have a suspiciously high latency and then uh, what would be my optimization uh, uh, flow. So let's uh, do this. Uh, my work, I don't have anything running, but I have a database created. Uh, the database stores different trades, so market trades, people buy and sell stocks. But right now, if we take a look here, there is no anything, I think, yeah, it was, it shows something, but no, I don't have anything running. So let me change this. I will start this application in Docker. I don't remember the command for sure. <laughs> That's why I need to copy and paste it. Probably I should have, you know, just copied it before, but that's uh, this command will start this market orders application. This exception is uh, harmless. It basically says that the schema already exists and you can see that right now the application keeps inserting trades uh, into the database cluster. We have, and it prints some basic statistics, how many, what are the most popular stocks and how many trades type of the fill or kill trades type we have. The fill, and, fill or kill trade type means that like whether execute this market request right now or just forget about it. So now let's jump back to the cluster, to the performance. Yeah, you can see that this chart goes up. We have reads, we have writes. This is what I wanted to see. Also, if I go to the to the cluster, right? So here is, I want to see some numbers. Yeah, you can see I keep refreshing. And their cluster is load balanced, which means that every node is both a primary and the replica. So, so far so good. And now let's go back to their live queries. So under the live queries, I have queries. I, I'm not sure that those queries are live. Yeah, some of those are live. You know what, Frank, actually this is, this looks they, like a, 
an issue? Yeah, I, actually, live queries uh, shows what uh, is in pgstat activity. So the queries are live in the sense that it's either a query that is currently executing or the last query executed by an idle session. So it's live in the sense where the, the, uh, the response has been sent to the client, the application, and uh, didn't, the, the, the application didn't run anything else. Actually, that's a good point because uh, that's not the behavior I see in the Yuga by DB managed. In the Yuga by DB managed, probably we had a, uh, some extra logic that will not show those queries that are already completed. Okay. If yeah. you click on, on one of them, you will have more detail and I think we will see the status. Yeah, status yeah, idle means that this one is not currently running. The session is connected as run this uh, statement. Uh, 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 commit and now is idle with nothing to do. Yeah. Yep. Good. Anyway, let's go to the slow queries. So here is under the slow queries, we do not show actually at least I'm on the version 2.17 and we do not show the average latency or minimum latency. This latency that you see is the total latency. So if I click here, you'll see that I had a 1050 calls requests of this kind and the total execution time was that high, but the minimum time is six uh, milliseconds and their average is 30 milliseconds. I would say that, you know what? I'm running everything in Docker and in my Docker, the latency is higher if to compare to a use case when I'm running in Yugo by DB managed. I don't know why. That's just a Docker on my Mac OS. I was, I was doing the same experiment with Yuga by DB Managed. I had a cluster in Google Cloud Platform yesterday. And then I had the same application running on my local laptop. So there was a, some network latency. And still, the latency was much better than what I have in Docker. I don't know why. Nevertheless, yeah, so laptops are usually not optimized for, for this kind of thing. They are more optimized to... to, to for many applications and uh, yeah. Good, good. But also keep in mind that this insert, I have a three node cluster and this insert also need to synchronize every update across three nodes. I have a replication factor of three. So and this is, yeah, this is one of my group buys. Uh, their average latency is like 40 milliseconds. Probably I don't want to optimize it, but here is, so let's take a look at this query. Uh, this query basically calculates the total number of trades. These fill or kill trades, you see this? It's a special type of trade. And uh, I would say that the latency can be definitely improved. So imagine that this latency looks really high. How can we improve it? Uh, let's uh, follow this. Let me connect to this uh, cluster instance using PSQL. My host is uh, local. Port well, number. Connect, I, I will mention that usually I compare the latency with the number of rows. Um, and in your case, you had a high latency for a, a, a small number of rows. So there is probably okay. something to optimize. Uh, probably it reads a lot to, to return. Um, yeah, Not actually, everything. let's copy this statement, right? I want to copy it. And uh, let's check the execution plan. So actually, what the application yep. logic checked, application logic logic checks, it checks this, fill or kill. Yeah, we have, you see that the number keeps changing. We keep inserting and mm -hmm. explain analyze. We'll show you that we are doing the full scan. That's probably yep. the worst scenario you want to have you don't want to have a full scan because generally speaking count count is not the best operation in distributed system but let's say if you want to do the count of a data subset like here then it's it's pretty reasonable but, if you but want it, it, it could be worse because here your count i see partial aggregate at least it is counted on on each tablet yeah at least yeah but that's an optimization we have Actually, good point. What what Frank is saying that at least the node, the coordinator for this request, doesn't need to pull the data from their storage, right, and then do this aggregation. At least on the storage side, in our DuckDB storage, we can execute 
uh, the count of the subset of the data on that node, and then the final numbers are delivered to their <clears throat> and, the, and the filter the also, I see remote filter. So uh, all all rows were scanned, but at least not move through the network. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. But nevertheless, right? We have this full scan, and it means that this operation is. I have three nodes cluster, and this operation executed on those three nodes. At least, yeah, we have this optimization with the pushdowns. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the latency, and this latency will be worse the more data I have, right? The more data I have, the more time it will take to execute this request. What we can do at least uh, the most straightforward approach, let's create a secondary index. So right now I don't have any secondary indexes for this table. Yeah, I have only the primary one. And we can create that index for this straight type column. Okay, so create index, let's give it a name, straight type index. And uh, on treat treat type waiting. So and let's uh, remind ourselves. Yeah, the latency was around twenty three milliseconds without the index. Yeah, it takes uh, when you execute DDL on a distributed uh, transactional database, it will take uh, more time, but at least you will be consistent. That's uh, the price you pay for the consistency. The, so the, 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 the fact is when you create the index, uh, we do not lock anything. That's the difference with Postgres. Postgres uh, needs an exclusive lock on the catalog, very short, but, but needs it. And to be scalable, we don't have it. And then by default, the create index just waits one second to be sure to get all the earth bits about the new version of the catalog. Mm. So basically, creating an index uh, on a small table will still take one second just because it waits to, to, to be sure that the catalog is synchronized. Excellent, excellent point. But it's created online and usually it's not a problem on, on a big table that one additional second is nothing. Mm -hmm. And even right now, like my application is live, it's running and the index yeah. was created online, no any disruption. Uh, what this is? Uh oh, it's just, <laughs> it's interesting. Ah, that was an exception. I cannot scroll up. That yeah, it, it can happen. Uh, we, we don't take an, ex an exclusive lock. Uh, it's kind of optimistic locking. If a query was using the old version of the catalog, then it can get a serializable error and that's to retry. I, I didn't see if it's exactly the message you have, but that can happen when you create an index online. Maybe some sessions will get a serializable error, like any anything that can happen with conflicts between transactions. Yeah, actually, and that's uh, and this is what we also need to keep in mind. Uh, I, this application is a Java application. I'll show you the core. Uh, for instance, this market order stream. And I'm ready because I know that's a database and I'm catching SQL exceptions. And for instance, here is if this is the code, like that's when a, uh, there was some serialization issue, meaning there are conflicting transactions, right? Or the database decided that there is a potential uh, inconsistency because you had a running query and something changed in real time, like the new index, then I'm, you know, just catching this exception and I'm restarting my request. This is what I need to do as an application developer. Yep. So that's, and my application keeps running. It's actually a good, uh, it's a good example. I mean, the application is still not affected. I'm, I just caught this exception. I printed that error into the log so that we can analyze what happened if necessary. But that was a harmless exception because it basically the database wanted to prevent a potential inconsistency and my application logic uh, re-executed that application, uh, that, that query. Okay, so folks, uh, here is the index it's created. So right now, if we run the same request, explain and analyze, it takes 15 milliseconds 12 milliseconds and before it was it was 28 milliseconds so two times better at least two times better on my docker and, in my and document. now you are scalable because before the time was proportional to the size of the table now the time is only proportional to the the number of rows that you read exactly because that's the proportional index to your results and also what's excellent is see this that's index on the scan 
we just we don't need to retrieve an entire row we just go through that index and uh, as long as we are calculating the count uh, we have everything needed we just need to calculate the number of rows that satisfies the search condition yeah. so okay so that's uh, the new execution time and i guess that if you go back to the monitoring ui if i keep refreshing it uh, where is this query yeah this one also should be updated yeah it looks like it's updated it's around the same time so generally that's uh, that's the workflow so what we demonstrated folks for those who are joining us right now that's uh, we have this slow query step and that slow query step can let you detect and analyze see a list of your queries execution statistics and if you think that some of the queries have a suspiciously high latency you can uh, optimize them and we what we detected is that this query was taking uh, a lot of time to be completed and we went ahead and uh, figure out that uh, that query need an index and we created an index so that's it and, um, and this information, so live queries comes from pgstat activity, slow queries come from pgstat statements, where, where we have also an ants with, with more statistics uh, to get more information. The, 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 the very interesting thing is that because we are distributed, if you want to query directly a pgstat activity or pgstat statement, you will see only what happens on the node where you are connected. Uh, what this UI does is that it queries all the nodes. And if you add new nodes because you want to scale, uh, they will be automatically collected. So you have this global view on your, clust uh, on your cluster, uh, mm -hmm. which is quite uh, useful. Yeah. And that's actually not an easiest uh, task to accomplish because you need to aggregate and you need to provide some averages. You need to provide the total. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal. That's excellent that this is available in the open source version so that you don't need to yeah. aggregate and uh, summarize yourself. Okay, so excellent. We've got uh, another question from uh, Ashwar. Uh, it's really nice and we can do visualizing the data also. So it's good. And please let me know if you want to apply ML models so then uh, how to use it. Uh, Machine learning models, it depends on what you need, uh, what uh, frameworks or extensions you depend on. Uh, probably there are first, there, if you already, the question is just to you, like, do you use PostgreSQL, right? If you use PostgreSQL, you use your database and you're looking at Yuga by DB as a way to become more scalable, more resilient, etc. cetera, uh, then we already have a lot. But then it depends on what exactly do you use for your machine learning models right now. Okay, we have the PG vector extension in PostgreSQL. That ex extension is on the roadmap uh, for Yuga by DB. It's not available yet, uh, but if you don't need that extension, then probably you already have anything you need with Yuga by DB. So feel free the, the, yeah. to the best is really question. to 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 see what is used with Postgres and see how it works with Yuga Byte. Uh, many things should work just the same. Uh, maybe there are a few optimizations behind uh, uh, that can be done and then open a Git issue. Uh, like, uh, I'm using this, it's faster on Postgres than on Nugabyte, and then you can look at it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, give a try. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, we can carry on the conversation in Slack. And uh, what else? Uh, I think that's it. I think uh, that's it for today. So folks, uh, we'll still have time. So we are waiting for your questions, whether you want us to give more details on anything related to Yuga by DB, or you want to show us, we have time for this. So feel free to type in. Any questions, questions remark, feedback, if some of you have already tested the uh, yugabyte the new ui the, the old ui uh, all, all feedback is very interesting that's also the point uh, that this new ui is still in um, in beta and and uh, the, the 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 goal is also to improve it to 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 provide the best user experience and it was if it starts by default it starts with yugabyte d 
this is all about user experience. You, you can start a cluster by starting the master, the T-servers yourself, but for to start, it's just easier to, to have a command start and, and then you have the URL and you go and you see your cluster. Mm -hmm. And I can show you folks, for instance, what Frank, uh, Frank uh, keeps mentioning the Yuga by D tool. Uh, that's for those who would like to start Yugabyte, let's say in Docker, on your laptops, on Windows, etc. Uh, that command can look as uh, follows. So that's my screen. I have some. Frank has a special lab. Probably we can discuss this lab in one of the future episodes where you can just execute the script and you will have a cluster over uh, desired configuration. Uh, what I have, you know, I frequently show uh, the multi-node, three-node cluster, a single-node cluster, but generally that's this Yuga by DB daemon, this uh, D tool I'm starting in Docker. And when I use this Yuga by DB start command, this new management and monitoring UI will already be available. And what I'm telling Docker, I just tell in Docker, then please ex export, make this port number of this UI available to my host operating system. So that's it. So my cluster right now, I have a three node cluster running. So where is the Docker? Yeah, here is my three node cluster running. And there, that's uh, the port number. Yeah, that's the port number that was exposed by the container to the host system, 15433. So that's, that's it. And yeah, and, and it, it works on, on, uh, on Intel and uh, ARM also. My, my lab was, was running on, on uh, ARM and, uh, and it works the same. The technology is uh, Java. Maybe you know more about the technology that was used. Uh, I think there is some uh, React uh, GIS for this new UI. I actually, yeah, I don't know, man. I I don't know like what uh what uh, languages I used, but definitely probably yeah, my UI. Java Java is a good choice, and then yeah, if you want to do the UI React or Next.js. I, I think that that's the way it was done. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, and then I also uh, see, let, let me share my screen just mm -hmm. one second. I was just checking that by default, th this is the documentation from uh, Yugabyte uh, D, the start command and the different options. And uh, in the documentation, we still say that the default is false, but now the, the UI is started automatically. So we need to update the documentation with that because it was default, it, it was not started. Uh, automatically, and now you don't need to, to pass the dash dash mm -hmm. UI option. Exactly, yeah, because I don't have uh, this parameter set to true in my startup uh, command, which means that, yep. Maybe we can also mention that you you don't need... Uh, that's, a, that's something I should check. I think it started by default on the first node, uh, because you don't need it on all nodes, uh, you can, of course, uh, but the console shows the whole cluster, so you don't need to start it on, the, on each node. Yeah, you don't need, uh, it's probably, but still, you don't need, but you can have it on every node. And as, as you mentioned, right, all those metrics are aggregated and accumulated. You have a global view. If one yeah. of the nodes uh, suddenly goes down, then you can switch to the yeah, maybe uh, one, one node on each region, and then you know that you can access the, the console and see what happens here. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And if you're using this for production deployment, and let's say you have you can have a special load balancer or reverse proxy, mm -hmm. you can just go to that one, and depending on your node availability or load balance, uh, you will, like one of the nodes will be serving the request for this you know, management and monitoring UI. So it's possible to come up with a HA solution for the management and monitoring you needed. Yeah, but that's useful because if if you have a failure somewhere, you uh, maybe you want to to look at the status of your cluster quickly, and you don't want first to troubleshoot the the, the console to well, then uh, troubleshoot the cluster. That's true. That's true. That's true. All right, my friends. Um, thanks for joining us. 
and there will be waiting for you during our next uh, episode we meet every other week so i think that the next one is on july 12th and uh, you can find us on slack you can propose any questions or any topics that you would like to be covered in detail as part of these episodes i and... see uh on linkedin a question suggestion from pete uh as always i would like to see views in the dictionary or oh, let me show it there mm -hmm. Uh, where I can see the same info using SQL SH and some SQL interface. Yeah, um, yeah, we are still thinking about that. Maybe, maybe the first step is to consolidate the information from all the nodes in the cluster within one UI and then provide it uh, views for each nodes with have them, pgstat activity and pgstat statement. And maybe we can add more information. But uh, yeah, having a view that queries all the nodes is also a possibility. The thing is, we want to be scalable and, and we don't want to add any possibility of, of a single point uh, that is a bottleneck. And if you start to have a view that queries all, all nodes in the cluster, then what should you do if one node is not uh, available? Uh, do you need to wait for the TCP IP timeout? Do you need to, to not to wait and, and just don't show the metric? Uh, if, if you have a view, for example, that, that provides the, 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 the number of active query on the whole cluster, if you cannot reach a node, uh, do you still show what is there or, or show nothing because you don't have it? Kind of consistency cross cluster. Uh, we have to think about it if you, if we provide the SQL interface. And I mean, folks, are you talking about some system level views? Are you talking about the views created by uh, an application, the user? What views are you talking about? Kind of a view, for example, a view that shows the PG start activity okay. from all nodes that will consolidate everything. Yeah. Like system level. Uh, yeah. Because uh, when it, if, if, uh, I just wanted to double check because if the question was about a materialized views that were created by my application, those views are visible. Yeah, no, but... I think I I also guess it because the question com comes from uh, an, an Oracle expert and and, mm -hmm. and Oracle has this kind of view. Uh, okay, Oracle has V dollar views for the for the statistics and G V dollar views for the global statistic across the cluster. But mm -hmm. yeah, Oracle doesn't have the same scalability cross data center with uh, with uh, or cross region, and, and and then it may be easier to show that. Yeah. I got it. Good to know. Good to know. You see, I also I'm also learning something new with every episode. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, uh, Pete, for your uh, question and remark. All right, all right. Yeah, we are coming to an hour, which means that's the time to wrap up and uh, wish everyone a good day and a good Yeah, and thank ahead. you, Pete, and uh, thank you, uh, Eshwa, and uh, hope to see you in the next episode. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, folks, bye-bye. See you soon. Bye.